Uh, hello, everybody. I'm Nick. I'm uh, the security engineering lead at Cloudflare. And uh, I'm going to talk to you today about Heartbleed, if you guys aren't sick of it already uh, <laughs> after this long year. So um, specifically, I'm going to talk about my personal experience or my experience at, at Cloudflare with uh, what happened during, during um, Heartbleed when it came out and what happened after the fact. So has anybody read this article? This is, this is a snippet from The Verge, and it is a kind of a semi-fictional account of what happened during the disclosure of, of Heartbleed. Um, I can kind of paraphrase a little bit how that conversation went, but it, it kind, of, kind of went a little bit like this. Like, so do you, do you use TL, DTLS? Uh, no, not that I know of. Does anybody use DTLS? And that's for websites, nobody used Datagram DTLS. Um, how about TLS Heartbeats? Well, well, my answer was, well, what, what's a TLS Heartbeat? I mean, at, at this point, barely anybody knew what this was. It was a very obscure feature. And um, he, the answer here was, was uh, oh, they're, they're stupid and, and there's a bug. You should turn them off. Right, so recompile OpenSSL with OpenSSL no heartbeats. And that was, that was kind of, that was that. So heartbeats were off for Cloudflare. We have a pretty simple architecture, so deployed it really quickly. And the answer was, OK, looks good. Public disclosure should be around April 9th. So, I guess a lot of people had this question, but what, why tell Cloudflare? Well, let me just go real quick and, and describe what Cloudflare does. So it's a reverse proxy. So if you have a website, uh, Cloudflare can sit in front of it and block malicious traffic. That's the sort of red X up there, as well as send cached content, static content. That's the bright orange. Uh, so it reduces anybody getting to your website that's malicious and reduces the load on your website. And for, for this to work, this cloud has to be closer to the visitor than it does have to be to your website. So we have this global network, so our, our nodes are closer to the visitors, and that's, that's how it works. And there's over a million sites on Cloudflare, including banks, government websites, Bitcoin exchanges, almost every Bitcoin exchange is on Cloudflare. Um, the IETF's website, Reddit, I can go on and on and on. Um, so lo lots of sites, but what Cloudflare does is very simple. It's essentially three services or, or two, uh, DNS, HTTP, and HTTPS, which is powered by OpenSSL and Nginx. So uh, the architecture is very simple in that every machine that we have can serve every site. So thinking back to Heartbleed, this is actually, you can see why this would be a really, really bad situation for Heartbleed to hit. Uh, anyways, so it happened early, April 7th, uh, 1027, OpenSSL published their advisory, and that hit Hacker News really quickly after that. Within half an hour, it hit the front page, and uh, about an hour later, we posted our standard Cloudflare, customer sites are patched, you don't have to worry about it, sort of um, post. And this, this was, you know, it, 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 was a, it was a thing. It was, it was a bug, and it was starting to gain, gain some steam. And then uh, about an hour after that, uh, there was a tweet from Codenomicon, and I, I think everyone can know what this is. This is, that's the next site. This Heartbleed itself, it was branded, and it came out to mass media. So this became a really big deal. Heartbleed.com had a logo, uh, hit the mainstream press. Heartbleed virus, I don't know if you guys remember that, but people were saying, oh, there's a Heartbleed virus out there. And uh, I, knew, I knew it got really bad when my, my mother called me and said, what, <laughs> what's going on? <laughs> So this was kind of a big deal, and well, we were finished patching, so well, we had some time to kill. What are we going to do? Uh, <laughs> at this point, there was, uh, we decided on three things, and one was to help keep this scanner that Filippo had from falling over. Uh, the second was to turn our network into a large honeypot to see what type of attacks or what type of scans are happening. And then the third was to decide or to figure out what we're going to do about our certificates. We have a quite a few websites that use our service, and many of them use SSL, and we had about 100,000 certificates, and revoking them was not a really 
at this point, the day after disclosure, it wasn't absolutely clear that this was something that you had to do. So uh, first, let's talk a little bit about this Heartbleed scanner. So Filippo, who's uh, now a Cloudflare engineer, uh, wrote this server in Go, and you type in your host name, and it scans it for, heart for whether or not it answers Heartbleed, heartbeat requests that are malformed. So these are small ones around 100 bytes so that it doesn't leak anything beyond your standard um, frame. It shouldn't leak any, any information. You put it on AWS and then put it behind Cloudflare. And um, shout out to Kyle Isom from our team for helping keep this up. But this, this is kind of what, from Filippo's server, what it looked like. There was up uh, uh, April 8th up to 2,000 requests per minute. So this was a very highly used tool. And that's nothing, because uh, this is the next two weeks. 2,000 is the, the bottom tick right there. So up, up to 10, 10 to 20,000 a day, uh, 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 10 to 20,000 scans per minute uh, for the next two weeks. And it, we held it up to 200 million tests in the first two weeks. Um, so with the scanner up and, up and running, yeah. And, th and th thank you to Filippo, wherever he is. He's somewhere in the room. Uh, stand up. This is, thanks for the tool. Uh, I, don't, I don't see him. He's somewhere. But in any case, this is, this is what, what he found. Um, in terms of domains, it was really bad at first. This is the, the ninth. This is two days after Heartbleed was originally announced. Uh, up to 30% of the sites that he scanned were vulnerable. And this luckily cut down, and um, a lot of people use this in their automated testing to validate sites. But yeah, it got down to a low low number pretty, pretty quickly. So now that that was up and running, back at, back at Cloudflare, we decide, well, what can we do? Well, we can log every heartbeat that we see that comes in with a, with a bad size. And uh, well, we can put that data in a shelf until now. And that's, that's kind of what we did. So uh, <laughs> here are logs from the ninth. And 69% of them had a message size of 16384, which um, you might know as the largest power of two you can fit into a signed 16-bit integer, um, but you might also recognize it as the hard-coded value in the SSL test Python tool that came out the first day. 20% um, were 121, and that, that was actually from Filippo's site. And University of Michigan, maybe, I, were you guys scanning on April 9th? Or, um, in any case, there were a lot of requests that um, used the zero length packet, which is another way to just check to see if your site is, is, is vulnerable. But, um, about a week later, it was around the same. So if there were people who were mass exploiting this against sites, uh, they were probably using just the basic SSL test Python script. And uh, around 20% were still Filippo's tests. So um, if you can, you can do the math here, uh, it's, it seems that a lot of people were just scanning with Filippo's tests. It wasn't a lot of mass exploitation. And um, flipping the, the numbers back, you see that 1% of Filippo scans were actually against sites on Cloudflare. So th this is what the map looks like for where the attacks were coming from. I know IP maps are not really that interesting. They don't tell you that much, but this is, this is where it is. There's some, some strange spikes, like in Iceland, but um, don't read too much into it. Um, now the question is, and, and this, is, this is what we were thinking when it first came out, was why was it really so dangerous? Why was Heartbleed so bad? Um, well, it's a kind of a layer six request that doesn't necessarily get logged. People don't log parts of handshakes very often unless you have a specific uh, IDS rule or something like that. And it's really bad in that 64K of, of server memory can be exfiltrated by one request. And this has log login info, session cookies, and uh, perhaps TLS private keys. We didn't know. And uh, if you kind of look at the diagram here, this is, that's the, the heap right there. Um, everything that's above the request, the, if you have a new request comes in, it gets put on the heap, and anything that was previously removed from the heap uh, is still sitting there. So um, we know that there are passwords, cookies, people were finding this right away. And um, the question was, would the key be there? Would, is the key going to sit ab above one of these requests? Um, so we looked at the code. Right? And what did the code say? Well, it said this can't happen. 
at least not in Nginx. The key gets loaded right away and therefore gets at the bottom of the stack. And any time that you do allocations or uh, for requests coming in, they're going to be higher up on the stack and they're not going to be able to read the original key. Right? Um, and Nginx itself was single threaded, so if you have a, it's not going to be able to catch something halfway in the middle of another thread doing an operation. So um, OpenSSL has a big number library that they use, and they, they clear the memory when they're done. So if you're doing a handshake for TLS, all the cryptographic material is going to be cleared by OpenSSL. Um, at least that's what we thought, right? And we, we weren't sure. I mean, I just looked at some code, and what do I know? So um, we launched the Cloudflare Heart Bleed Challenge. So it was a, this was something that we did to crowdsource an answer. Um, so we set up a, a standard Nginx, which was outside of Cloudflare. It was on a, a third-party VPS, and it had the vulnerable version of OpenSSL. And we said to all of you guys, come and find it. See what you can do. And to, to show proof, give us a message signed with that private key. What did we find? Well, for the first couple hours, there was, there was trolling. And uh, as you can, <laughs> somebody clapping because they did this, but uh, um, basically anything that you post onto the page is going to be put into memory in the Nginx. So uh, people were posting private keys in there and they were posting what looked like, uh, you can see my name there, Nick, what looked like a passwords file. So everyone was getting really confused, getting all this, there's a private key in my Heartbleed request, and, but nobody was actually getting the key uh, until we saw this tweet from uh, Fedor. And um, we took a look. This is the Cloudflare office. It's me pointing out a television screen. And um, yeah, he solved it. So congrats to Fedor. And so he, he wasn't the only one. Uh, this was in the first 24 hours or so. There were 12 people. In the first 48, about 25 people had, had solved it and got the real key and sent proof. So can you steal private keys? Absolutely, yes. And it was solved in under 10 hours. And private keys can definitely be, be vulnerable. But another thing we did was we logged where in memory the Heartbleed requests were coming in. And we compared that relative to where the private key was initially allocated. And they, they never overlapped. So how, how, did this, how did it actually get solved? Well, <laughs> there was, yeah, there was a second bug in OpenSSL. Uh, <laughs> who would have known uh, looking through that code? <laughs> If you dump the memory of, uh, of the request, all the places in red uh, are where key private keys did exist at one point. And it turns out some temporary variables were not wiped. Uh, this, is the, this is the code to clean up the mess. There's big num free versus big num clear free. This is just, uh, yeah, it was just in certain cases in the Montgomery multiplication, they didn't clear up. They didn't clean the, the partial pieces. Uh, we can do a little bit of math just to show how people actually solved it with this. But um, RSA, you have a couple different things. You have a public exponent, E. Um, you have two primes multiplied together, and they make the public key, and a private exponent, D. And any one of the, if you get any one of PQ or, or D, you get the whole private key. So what people did was they took every 128-bit block that they saw, in uh, exfiltrated Heartbleed data, and they just tried to divide it into the mod modulus. And if it divided, there you go, it's factored. And this is how nine out of the 10 people solved it. Uh, it turns out that one of the prime factors is just sitting there on the heap after tens of thousands of requests, you might luck upon it. But um, one enterprising gentleman, Ruben Zhu, who's um, at University of Cambridge, he used a, a much cleverer method, which is copper, Coppersmith's attack, which is a lattice reduction attack, where you only really need about 60% of one of the private keys to, to, if, to find it out. And this depends on the fact that the public exponent is small. So um, for performance reasons, the public exponent in RSA is, is small, so that any public operation is, is really fast. But um, he solved it in only 50 requests. So this was, that was actually really interesting. <laughs> so
So private keys are gone, right? What does that mean? Revocation time. Um, <laughs> you know, the, the internet was built for this, right? I mean, people who designed the PKI, they said, yeah, you know, people are going to revoke 100,000 certificates in 24 hours. This is just, this is, <laughs> this is how we design the system, right? And um, this is what SANS kind of reported. That's, that's mostly us, actually. That's, that's all the internet, but that's mostly Cloudflare. Um, and this is, this is what it looked like. The blue line is revoke certificates. And as you can see, that's April 7th. This is after Heartbleed. This is when everybody was revoking. And then that green spike is, is uh, Cloudflare revoking. But um, once we revoked all these certificates, we found out that, well, it didn't really mean that browsers wouldn't accept these cer certificates anymore. And uh, I can go into that really quickly. There are three methods to do this that w were built for you know, handling revocation in certificates in X509. And uh, first is the certificate revocation list. And this is just a flat file with a list of certificates that are revoked. And did us revoking 100,000 certificates break CRLs? Heck yeah, it did. Uh, <laughs> so the, the CRL from GlobalSign grew from 22 <laughs> to 5 megs. Yeah. This basically DDoSed the uh, CRL server, and <laughs> lucky for this, lucky for GlobalSign, Cloudflare was in front of their CRL server, but unlucky for us. <laughs> we're, we're used to that kind of traffic, but yeah, you can see here every three hours there are waves, and this had to do with the cycles in which CRLs were updated and Microsoft Internet Explorer downloading them. and. Um, yeah, it was pretty rough. Anyways, CRL is broken. How about OCSP? OCSP, well, this is the online certificate status protocol. This is a kind of question answer. Is this certificate revoked? Yes or no. And um, well, it's, it's really broken. And, and Chrome has kind of known this for a while and stopped checking. Uh, but if you have hard fails, it does I'll disallow you from using certain networks, especially with captive portals. And if you have a soft fail, um, somebody on the network can just kind of drop the OCSP response and voila, the site is no longer revoked. So it, it really doesn't work or scale to the degree that we'd want it to in plain OCSP being requested from the browser in that sense. Um, how about CRL sets? This is Google's proprietary method that it, they basically collect all the CRLs that they can from different uh, certificate authorities and put them together and install them in the browser. So you get updates with the browser of these sets of CRLs. I shouldn't say all the CRLs, but um, it's specific certificates. And this is kind of what we found out. It, they only do EV certs and special EV certs. And um, if the browser doesn't get updated, then you're not going to get an update in your CRL set, which is it, it, it's kind of bad. Um, so CloudflareChallenge.com, once it was solved, we revoked it. And the way it was, um, it was not an EV cert, but Chrome did mark it as revoked because, well, they added it manually into a JSON file. Um, so none of the 100,000 Cloudflare certificates were being marked as revoked by Google Chrome. So uh, we, we basically made a hack, and uh, I don't know if you can read this, but it's the most efficient four lines of C++ revocation. This is in Chromium. It revokes all of our certificates. This is a hack. You sh this is not scalable. You shouldn't do it this way. But it was, it was how, how it had to get done, because there were no valid ways of, of doing revocation. Um, so yeah, revocation is pretty much broken. And um, what can we do? Well, there's shorter certificate expiration periods, that could help. That would at least help with the CRLs because you won't have to be holding on to old certificates for very long. You can sort of shrink the size of the sets pretty quickly. Um, OCSP must staple is an extension that requires you to send the, o the server to send the OC OCSP response in the handshake. Um, that can help too. Certificate transparency, something else that's thrown out um, there to solve this, but you know, not, none of these are widespread, and none of these have been implemented. So something has to work for revocation. So I guess in, in summary, there are three things that we did after, after Heartbleed. Um, we kept the scanner from falling over, turned our site into a honeypot, and well, we definitively answered that, yes, you have to revoke your certificates, and there's no excuse.
so th there's a lot of takeaways from Harplead, right? Um, I, I don't want to, to be the one to sort of tell everybody how to take away from, what to learn from this, but um, open source disclosure is hard, and this, this really sh was the first one of the year of what turned out to many be many open source disclosures, and um, we did learn a lot of lessons of how to do that correctly. Um, other things that pointed out, which seem obvious to people, but you know weren't obvious in or weren't in OpenSSL, which is features should be disabled by default. Nobody who installed OpenSSL 1.01 wanted heartbeats necessarily, so turn off features by default. Another thing is, well, expect the unexpected. That's sort of obvious in computer security. That, we didn't really learn that from Heartbleed, but it was, um, it was definitely a shock when it came. Um, other things, these attacks, a lot of the attacks on real sites that Cloudflare saw, we saw quite a few attacks, as, as I mentioned, but a lot of them were, still, were just scans from people just trying to see if their sites were, were alive. So that's, that's a reassuring sign. Um, crowdsourcing was effective for the Heartbleed Challenge. I couldn't find the private keys, and luckily there are very smart people out there who were able to, to find it. Is anybody here in the, in the auditorium a winner of the Cloudflare Challenge? Is anybody here? I don't see any hands, but anyways. I don't have my glasses. Uh, so congratulations wherever you are. Um, and the, the last thing is, is revocation needs a solution. And uh, the, la the last so conclusion from this is, is really um, you know, support OpenSSL. Uh, it's, it's, um, I messed up my microphone there, but... Um, <laughs> Thanks. No, really. I mean, this is this is part of critical infrastructure for the world and for not only websites, but as Zach here was telling, in embedded devices. Uh, and and these guys need support. So please support OpenSSL. And I'm done. Thank you. Okay, quick announcement before we start the Q&A. If you are going to leave the room, please get up now, go out quietly without talking so we can do the Q&A nice and quickly. Also, uh, you will be only able to leave the room at this point. Um, yes, if you have any questions, please line up at the microphones. Uh, we'll start with microphone number one. Um, thanks, not really a question, thanks, thanks for the talk. We really, really followed the progress even before the talk with, with your paper you published, and we just want to contribute a piece of missing information. So the first attacks, as you call them, 24 hours after the disclosure, that, that were us. We weren't really attacking. Uh, we started working on a scanner uh, about 20 minutes after the public information, and it was the top scanner in the region. So it was a scanner and used multiple different m methods. We just uh, as we went, we came to the conclusion that uh, there may be firewalls in, be deployed in between, which, which may stop some of the packets. So we oh. used many different packets in, one, in, in, in every request. So that's also a scanner there. Cool. Is your mic on? No. no. A uh, quick uh, interruption, if you're leaving on the uh, ground floor, please only use the front left and the front right door. Uh, if you're up there, you can use any door you want, but if you're down here, please only use this door and this door to leave the room. Thank you. Does your mic work yet? Hello? Yes. Okay, there you go. Yep, thanks for the comment. I, I don't think I saw anything specific to, to, to your, your account, but... Yeah, no, no, it's great to know. So, I mean, it's one of those things that's really hard to tell from our perspective whether something's going to attack, whether someone's malicious, or was, whether there's someone just scanning. Um, a lot of the, the, the hosts that we see don't have any information that identify kind of what the intent is. 
Microphone number two, please. Hello, um, I have a question to Cloudflare. Could you stop blocking toy users, please? Uh, you make the internet more central every day. All the fancy homepages switch there, and come on, the Tor network is so small you could handle it with that finger snip, all of the bandwidth, and you're blocking all the end nodes all the time. We're, we're looking into solutions for Tor. Uh, the, the main problem is that there is a lot of spam on Tor for websites, and uh, right now, filtering through the good and the bad is something that we're working on, and we are focusing on that this year. So look for something coming up this year for Tor users. Thank you. Next up, we have a question from our signal angel asked on IRC. Yeah, thank you. Um, so given that maximum TLS record length is 16 kilobytes, uh, how is it possible to even get back 64 kilobytes? Uh, it's you can split you can split a heartbeat request over multiple records, I believe. I think that I'm pretty sure that's how it works. Yeah, Mic uh, microphone number one, please. What is your opinion on Libra SSL? Go for it. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm not sure if I'm the most qualified person to answer that. Um, to be honest. Um, I think there's well intentioned. I think uh, the community acknowledges that there are a lot of problems in OpenSSL um, in terms of its maintainability. Um, it's one solution. I'm not sure if it's the correct one. Uh, yeah, I think I think LibreSSL works for its goal, which is OpenBSD. Um, they have a portable version by now, as well as they did with all their other forks, and. Uh, it's much cleaner code, and still OpenSSL tries to support way old systems like Windows 16-bit and bullshit you really don't need, so the unmaintainability will remain for a while. Yeah, I, I, I agree that yeah. OpenSSL does support quite a lot of different platforms, and some people need that, um, but the, the different forks of OpenSSL that have come recently, LibreSSL, BoringSSL, uh, are taking patches from each other. So I, I think the more people looking at this project, the better. We have time for one more question. Microphone number three, please. Uh, hello. Um, both your talks, you showed numbers of um, vulnerable sites decreasing and increasing again afterwards. Can you explain that? So I think there were small bumps um, that were just people coming and going. I don't think we saw a lot of um, websites that became vulnerable. I think a lot of it is just uh, pieces of measurement websites that came and go between different scans. Um, I don't think there were any large jumps um, that we saw. When it comes to the data that I was showing, this is from Filippo's uh, scanner, and uh, not everybody was scanning the same domains every day. So that's just standard variance. Thank you very much, Sakir and Nick. Please give uh, our speakers a warm round of applause.